welcome to the Gottesdienst crowd, where we foster confessional integrity, liturgical preservation, and preaching that doesn't stink. We believe that the historic liturgy of the divine service is more than mere cobwebs of antiquity, but it is a true treasure of the church to be dusted off and brought down from her attic to be enjoyed. So let's get dusting. Welcome back to the Goddess Teens Crowd. This is Jason Broughton. Today we have back with us Mark Preuss. We are looking at the uh, second part to our Gods of Our Age, the Aphrodite. Uh, last time we took a look at Nimrod, uh, Sargon the Great, and uh, Nimrod's daughter, and all of the uh, kind of fertility worship that came out of that, and the, well, not to put too much of a, a term to it, but, it, you know, it's kind of gross. Um, <laughs> but uh, today, no, we're gonna, right. today we're going to get back into it with uh, moving towards the Aphrodite cults and other things. So welcome back, Mark. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So where do you want to begin this time? Well, it's, uh, I guess, to review... Whatever you fear, love, and trust in the most is your God. And in our day and age, it can be difficult to to make people realize that they're actually worshiping gods. Even though there are no temples to these gods, uh, there, uh, there are no names to the gods, and, uh, and few stories. Uh, mm -hmm. But nevertheless, Moses says, and Paul repeats it, that the sacrifices that are made to idols or false gods are offered to demons and surrounding false gods is false doctrine. The devil is the author of, of lies. He's the father mm -hmm. of lies. And so teachings, teachings and stories and, uh, and cults or worship and temples and sacrifices are all related to actions and desires. Uh, that reflect the fears, loves, and trusts in men. Because the devil appeals to what the sinful flesh fears, loves, and, and uh, uh, fears, loves, and trusts. Mm -hmm. So in, in nearly every pagan civilization, there is some sort of a goddess of sex. And we're going to be moving from Babylon or from the kingdom of, of Nimrod or Sargon the Great to uh, to the Greco-Roman world today to talk about Aphrodite or Venus. And there are some differences, and it's actually a bit more recognizable to us who have a lot of our civilization built on Greco-Roman uh, Greco ideas, Greco-Roman influence, science, philosophy, etc. So that's what we're going to be getting into today. Okay. And uh, do you have any questions about the last, the, the first segment? Uh, no, no, I got all those out. Uh, so just, yeah, just trudge ahead. Okay, thanks. So all of these goddesses are related. Uh, we talked about Ishtar or Inanna. Inanna was the Sumerian goddess and Ishtar was the Akkadian goddess and, and Assyrian goddess. And they're, they just merged together. There's something about paganism that just recognizes this, that, hey, we're basically worshiping the same God. And that's why when you get to, when you start to hear people say, oh, everybody, we're just worshiping the same God. That is, that is a mark of, of paganism. And it's, it's actually fairly honest in the sense that, yeah, so this God is a God of war. Well, that's my God. I just call him by a different name. Mm -hmm. And so also with the goddess of sex, it is that way as well. And Aphrodite has clear connections to Astarte, who is Ashtoreth, the Ashtoreths of the Old Testament, uh, which were wooden, often wooden idols set up on high places and in groves of trees where they would practice uh, cult prostitution and they would have feasts. And these were these were very fun and they were profitable for businesses. Mm -hmm. People sold things there. It was part of the economy. And they also would sell their daughters into slavery to pay off debts. And this is this happens still today in the world. 
And what people don't realize, this this was very common in China. I read a book by, oh, I forget the, I forget the the guy's name, but it was early Missouri Synod Lutheran, and it was on all diff, all sorts of different religions. The kind of book that we need to put out today. And he was describing, he was quoting a pastor, a Lutheran missionary in China, in the nineteen teens or twenties, who asked him, "What would you do?" He had a wife and he had a few children. And he said, what would you do if your wife died? And he said, I would sell my children and, and buy a new wife. And so this kind of behavior is, and you still have this, uh, you still have this today all over the world. Thailand, we'll talk about in a little bit. But this kind of glorification of our desires, uh, a really good book is Adolf Kaberly's The Quest for Holiness. Mm -hmm. And uh, he talks about how man tries to approach God through different means, through his mind or his will or his emotions or experience. And that, and, and in the course of discussing this, he says that man has always wanted to spiritualize his basest desires. And we see that in particular with, with Aphrodite. Uh, mm -hmm. The Greeks are more reasonable. The Greeks, they love reason. And their goddesses, their gods and goddesses are the most like real men. You go to the Eastern religions or uh, of Egypt or of, of Babylon, and these gods and goddesses are often, you know, they might have appendages that don't, that people don't have. They might uh, have powers that, that are kind of like superhero powers, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you would call, the the eastern religions that would be closer to like superhero movies you know with all these yeah. powers whereas the greeks that would be closer to soap operas or or dramas <laughs> and the stories that they have um now that's not always true in in the theogony i mentioned this in a previous episode and he see it's theogony the birth of the gods we have this just really disgusting uh there are two uh origins of Aphrodite, which Plato says are two different goddesses, but who knows. Um, and one of one of the stories is from Hesiod and the other is from Homer. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Kronos goes after Uranus or Uranus, who, uh, who is heaven. Yes. And uh, yes, Kronos goes after Uranus. That's right. The, uh, <laughs> but he actually went after and he, he cast- Keep it he, clean, Mark. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to say Uranos from now on because that's yeah. the Greek pronunciation. Uh, we actually had yeah. we actually had a discussion about this at around our table because we were talking about the planet. I'm like, well, you know, this yeah. is actually based on, you know, this um, Titan from Greek mythology, and it's you know it's the Greek word for heaven, so you should really say Uranos, but they just like yeah. saying Uranus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or Uranus. Either way, you're going to yeah. say something bad. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you just say U Uranus. But he was castrated by his son Kronos, and uh, that's just disgusting. But there you can see that you know they, they portray him as a man, and from the uh, from the foam of that, Aphrodite came, uh, which Af Aphrodite means like from the foam, basically. Yeah. And so there is a, a sexualization of her that really appeals to man's desire, right? Um, mm -hmm. Nevertheless, the Greeks were much more chaste in their depiction depictions of women for a long time uh, than than the Eastern religions were. The, uh, the she was always if if you're looking at 500 or 400 BC, uh, generally all of the all of the uh, the statues of Aphrodite's Aphrodite were clothed. She was clothed, mm -hmm. and and Athens had had who which worshipped Aphrodite. Uh, they had commissioned a statue for the temple of uh, Aphrodite there. But the man who the man who carved it carved it so that she was naked, mm -hmm. and Athens refused it. But the city of Cnidus accepted it. And, and that was the first nude statue of Aphrodite that you can find in, in, in the Greek world. Mm -hmm. And so again, they're more, they're more, uh, they're more human. They're more, 
realistic and in certain ways more chaste, but mm. it wasn't a chaste affair at all. And trying to keep this clean, and this is why I hesitated even to do this one, is because it's like you read about this stuff and it's just shocking. But they put, because it, they considered it so beautiful, uh, Aphrodite of Knidos, they built a temple in the round. And so it was a temple around so you could walk around and just admire Aphrodite. Mm. And they found evidence of, uh, like tons of evidence of unclean acts mm -hmm. performed there by men because of that. So this is pornography. Mm. Uh, th th and that happened, but that didn't happen until the fourth century, like the 300s. Right. So that's relatively late on the scene. Uh, the other story of Aphrodite is that she was born from she was born from uh, Zeus. And I forget who's what was her name. One of the Titans. And uh, and either way, she is a goddess of love, beauty and sexuality. That's what she is. Right. Um, just generally. And she encourages she encourages uh, you to release your passions so that you can think more clearly, et cetera. So th there's a, you see this in a lot of the philosophers where they justify prostitution and other things and dalliances with other women uh, simply because, well, that's man's nature. And you see that a lot today. Um, and the, the, the city that worshiped her the most was Corinth. Before the Romans destroyed it in the second century, there may have been as many as five temples to Aphrodite there. And in the past, I've, I've, I've exaggerated the numbers, but there were thousands of, of, of temple slaves there, temple prostitutes. And Corinth was situated, it's on that wonderful isthmus, which is one of my favorite words to say is isthmus. Not but, one uh, of my favorite words to say. Not one of your favorite isthmus. Yeah, yeah. isthmus. Well, um, your favorite word to say is often, but you mispronounce it. I, well, this is, that's why, this is why it's not my favorite word to say, because I try to pronounce all of the letters. Oh yeah, <laughs> I don't do just that. Just like I an often, an I say Arctic. <laughs> it's wonderful. We, that's that's our heritage from France. Is that from French? Is that we can just skip letters? But in any case, uh, at Corinth is was a huge, huge port city and a, and a very important city because the sailors they didn't like to sail out in the open sea. They sailed as close to uh, coastland as they could. And so all of the things going from, to Rome or out to the West or to the Greek colonies out there, which were very rich, or to Sicily or other things like that, uh, or from the Black Sea and through there, all of these, all of these ships would go through Corinth. And uh, they would have put these uh, boats on rails and just carry them across. Well, what, who, who live on ships? Who does? Sailors. Who live on ships? Sailors do. And what are sailors known for? They are known for lots yes. of, you know, they get their wages and they waste them. And there were like sayings about like, it's not like every, the cowboys of old, like the cowboys of old. Yeah. Or pirates or whatever. Um, but there were sayings like, like, like a trip to Corinth is not for every man because people would lose, they just spend all their money and they would spend it on these, these uh, slaves. These were people who were sold into slavery to pay off debt or captured in battles and other things like that. They were not just women and they were also girls and they were not just men, they were boys. And you, it wasn't as, there, there's a lot of debate on it. In the East, it was, they really spiritualized the prostitution to such an extent that they would even prostitute their own daughters to justify it, right? And make it all look all holy. But here in, in with Aphrodite, the temple prostitutes were basically just, they were prostitutes. And you're worshiping Venus, of course, by doing it, but it's 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 a brothel, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And and people, the 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 horror of it was that uh Aphrodite basically he she's the one who drives you mad. She's the one who it's kind of like Bacchus in this sense, but she's the one who incites the the lust in you, right? Mm. And so, so you need to get it out. And there's no limit on what you can do with a slave. Do you see? So, so they think they 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 say this is how you control it, but in fact, it just led to the horrible, horrible degradation of these slaves. People doing whatever they wanted, and mm. it, and it was very bad. And I think that it was it was it was for a political reason and for rebellion that Rome 
uh, totally leveled Corinth. I mean, just destroyed it uh, to punish it um, mm -hmm. and make the other Greek cities be like, whoa, they just destroyed this ancient, amazing city. Uh, but that was the punishment of God yeah. because they, so, they tolerated lots of evil. Yeah. So my question about, uh, about the way that they viewed this was, was it, and maybe it's a combination of these things, but was it primarily seen as a releasing of a pressure valve or was it seen as a means of, of enlightenment um, to engage in these acts? Right. So on the one hand, it sounds like a little of both, but primarily what would, did they? I would not say that the Greeks viewed it as a way of enlightenment. Okay. It would, it was, it was a way of, it was a way of, uh, to get, you know, to get your passions out of the way. Okay. Uh, and, and, and you see this with their stories. I mean, it's, it's, they have hilarious stories. Homer tells the story of, of, so Aphrodite is married to Hephaestus who mm -hmm. has his, who has his, uh, kiln in, um, uh, in, uh, Sicily at Mount Etna. And he, you know, Hephaestus is her brother in some stories and is, is Zeus and Hera's son, but he fell down from heaven and broke his leg. So he, he walks with a limp and he's not mm -hmm. good looking. He's, he's pretty ugly. And so Aphrodite is constantly cheating on him. Right. And mm -hmm. one time he's, he's, uh, she, she's cheating on him with Ares, the God of war. And and I mentioned this when we talked about Ares or Mars and Hephaestus finds out and he is a Smith. And so he goes and makes this, this, this net out of metal and catches them and throws it on them and then invites all of the gods over to laugh at them. And so you have this big, strong Ares who's always mad and everything like that. And mm -hmm. this beautiful, uh, this beautiful Aphrodite just mocked by all the gods and everybody's laughing at them. And this is a interesting. This is an interesting thing, you know. The Greeks, they this would never happen. These stories would never be told in Babylon, you know, mm. about gods that that where you just mock them. And this is like mm. 800 BC, you know. This comes from Homer, so they, that's why I said earlier it's more like soap operas or or dramas. And you have tons of these stories. And Ovid is a, is collected a lot of them, probably made up some of them. Mm -hmm. But you have all tons of these stories where the gods, the power of the gods uh, to uh, to influence man is actually a power that they themselves are subject to. Yeah. Right? So they make them like men. And so you have uh, you have the story of uh, Ovid tells this in his Amores where you have Apollo is walking and he sees Cupid or Eros uh, in, and, uh, Eros has got his bow and he's like small and Apollo had just killed the Python. And he's like, what are you doing boy with that, with that bow? Leave, leave the killing to me, you know? Mm -hmm. And Cupid gets all mad and he has two arrows, one, a, a sharp arrow that, uh, I think it's a golden arrow that makes you fall in love with the first person you see. And another is a, is a lead blunt arrow that makes you run away from the first person you see. And so he, he shoots Apollo with the arrow and Apollo is the God of reason. He's the God of light, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the, the temple of Apollo is in, uh, uh, is in Delphi. That's where you go to the Oracle to get wisdom. Right. And where he, he says, know yourself, you know, know thyself. And all of he, so he sees this girl named Daphne, which is in the Latin Laurel and an English bay or bay leaf. Right. Mm. That's where we get bay leaves from. And so Daphne, uh, and then she shoots Daphne with a blunt arrow. And so Apollo, the God of Reason, goes mad with love and starts running after Daphne. And Daphne is terrified of the God and hates him with all her heart and and runs away from him. And it's just like it's like Pepe Le Pew. Uh, <laughs> if you ever see the old, uh, you know, the old uh, Bugs Bunny or Looney Tunes, yes. you know, it's like Pepe Le Pew and the cat. And so that he's running after. And so you have this comical situation where the God of Reason is in is 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 subject to this power do you see this power that's greater than anything it's mm -hmm. greater than reason even and yet it's comical they make fun of it and then she the, the story ends where she prays to i think artemis who is uh apollos's sister i don't remember but i think it's artemis and and she becomes the the bay tree where you get the laurel crown 
And that's why you give uh, laurel crowns to people who win poetry and other things like that, which are associated with Apollo. So it's, it's, there's an ideological, ideological explanation for it, but there's humor. Do you see what mm -hmm. I mean? Like they, they're mocking their gods. And yeah. yet at the same, at the same time, they subject the gods to power. Now this goes back to Hesiod, where if you remember in Hesiod's Theogony, you have three, you have three gods who are there at the beginning. There are three mm -hmm. gods and it is chaos mm -hmm. and, and Tartarus or hell mm -hmm. and Eros, right? Which is yes. sexual desire, sexual desire. And so these are above the gods, just like mm -hmm. the fates are. And so yeah. even the gods are subject to this power. So the Greeks deified powers, and just as people do, they deify powers that they don't understand, right? And yeah. since the Greeks value reason so much, they recognize, they, and this is what makes them a little bit more sober about things sometimes, but also makes them able to laugh at something. They recognize how ridiculous the power of of, of sexual desire is right. Mm -hmm. And it even subjects the gods. Yeah. You definitely get the, the impression you mentioned, you know, not only these, these powers at the beginning of Hesiod's theogony, but also, uh, you know, in, in, in Homer's Iliad, you get the idea that you mentioned that they're subject to fates, right? That Zeus has no power over whether, um, Troy will beat the Achaeans. He says that the yeah, fates, yeah, the, the the fates, fates are decreed. there. We can, we can, you know, make this last longer. But fate has cast its die. Yes, yes, and that's that's in most religions to some extent. The, the Greeks dealt with with fate by basically uh, having powers that they can actually perceive and somewhat understand, dealing with the daily, dealing with daily life. Mm -hmm. And what they can see, uh, and and so that you, the Greek, the Greek, the Greek reaction to something really bad happening, could be blaming a god if 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 it's like, oh, you're the god in charge of this, or you're like with with, uh, hey, my wife cheated on me, Aphrodite. Uh, but but with other things, they would just shake their fist at the heavens and 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 at the fates, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but but it's more entertaining to talk about the gods and the powers that are there, and. Mm -hmm. And and with with the Greeks, Eros is extreme. It's one of those things that you can't control. It's not just as I mentioned before with with Inanna. It's not just that this doesn't just deal with man's loves or his desire. Like whatever you love the most or desire the most is your god. It also involves man's fear mm -hmm. because it's a powerful thing, and you need to control it. Well, how are you going to control it? Well, you need to worship. Aphrodite. And this is what I mentioned this last time. They're going to do it anyway, Jason. They're going mm -hmm. to do it anyway. So you might as well teach them and give them uh, prophylactics. You know what yeah. I mean? And so that's that's definitely a pagan attitude towards sin, towards sinful desire. And it also, you know, it's not, you get this with all sorts of weird things. Um, man, According to Aristophanes, who's just disgusting, he's a he's a comedic playwright in mm -hmm. uh, classical Athens, and in Plato's Symposium, he's there, and he has this notion of how man came to be, and man generally he looked like a ball, and he had four arms and four legs, and four eyes, etc., and, and including the reproductive organs. And there would be two men joined together, or two women to join together, or a man and a woman joined together. But they were so strong because their desire was satisfied that they tried to climb up heaven and, and, and conquer the gods. And so Zeus had Apollo cut them in half. So they were separated from each other. And, and, uh, and, but, but he, he put their, their parts, the, their reproductive parts on, the, on, on their backs so they couldn't, they couldn't see each other. And so all they would do is just hold each other and they were dying out. And so Zeus had pity on him and had Apollos or Apollo fix it. And you know, sew them up so that now that's where we get our why we have a belly button and we have a few wrinkles here and there. Yeah. And it's, it's what, the point. It's a disgusting story, and Aristophanes likely just made it up. But it's the kind of story that people would believe and hold mm -hmm. on to about things. And what it is is that it's not based on creation. Like, hey, this is the design. 
God made the man for, or God made the woman for the man. And the man was created obviously with a woman in mind, right? So you see, and then, and the purpose of this is for children. The purpose of this is so that they might have a partnership and, and that one is stronger than the other and, and, and one is, is weaker than the other in different ways, right? And like, I, it's not a, I don't like to use this too much because I hate the yin yang, but without the dots in it, the man and woman's relationship is like that. A man has certain strengths that help the woman and a woman has uh, helps the woman's weaknesses and a woman has certain strengths that helps the man's weaknesses. And that kind of, you know, to mock, to mock that as they do uh, in, in the Greco-Roman world and to, to ignore that and to place more value on people's desire and whatever you want is, is, very, is very telling for us today where creation is entirely ignored. Like we have to pretend that a man pretending to be a woman is a woman that, oh, I'm, I'm just, you know, I have, I'm a man trapped in a woman's body. That is that your, desi- your desire determines who you are rather than what God actually created you to be. There's no confession or concession that this is sin. It's just simply is. Mm-hmm. And, and so the Greeks would say, hey, you know, grow up, you know, don't, there, there were different, it just gets so gross. I, I, I can't get into it too much, but they, they pack the, the Greeks practice pederasty, right? That's why Cupid, Aphrodite's mm-hmm. son is a boy, you know, is a boy because they liked the prepubescent boys and they would teach them their, they would teach him stuff and, and, uh, and, but they would commit disgusting acts with them. And this was considered not per se the worship of Aphrodite. They, but they, they, they attributed it to Aphrodite to have these desires. And so, you look at how she was worshipped. They also dealt with the practical problems. So, in the they have found in temples to Aphrodite throughout the Greco-Roman world, uh, and this is true for lots of different gods and goddesses. So, say you you uh, you broke your uh, arm, mm-hmm. in you broke your arm. You'd go to a temple of someone who it might even be somebody like Athena, who was wise and helped help doctors and you would buy a terracotta a clay a baked clay little figurine of an arm and you would dedicate it to uh athena Mm -hmm. and you find these things all over if you're if your foot's lame you go to the foot god you go to the foot goddess do you see what i mean yeah the doctors and there would be doctors there who would treat it and they would get paid by you buying the buying the figurine Mm-hmm. Well, guess what kind of figurines you have in Aphrodite's temples and in Venus's <laughs> temple. I don't so, <laughs> yeah, you go, you go, and that's why they're called venereal diseases. Venus, and if you know Venus Veneris or Venus Veneris, yeah. a venereal is the adjective for Venus, because you, they would go to these temples, get the disease from the temple, and then go back to the temple to get healed from the disease by Aphrodite. Oh and goodness. so they were paying money. And so they had not just prostitutes at the temple to Aphrodite. They had doctors who were priests. Okay. Do you see what I mean? So, yeah. hey, go have safe sex. And then you go, they go out and have safe sex, what they call safe sex with some mm-hmm. quotes around it. And then they come back to the same basic people to get help from the diseases that they got from safe sex. Mm-hmm. Go so this is basically sex. Planned Parenthood. Yeah, this is, oh, absolutely. This is Planned Parenthood. Yeah. 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 You go there, you go there, and then you go back to get the baby taken care of, you know, mm-hmm. or, or, or to get treatment for a sexually transmitted disease. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it's definitely, so that, that's where, you know, to justify it, it's, this is where we as Christians, like we, it's such a, God is so amazing in creating man uh, and then creating woman. And that with the man, you know, the beasts, they have desire for each other, but they, they, uh, for some of them, it's painful for some of them. It, it they just, it's like once a year or twice a year, right. Mm-hmm. Or depending on what kind of an animal it is and is entirely for reproduct for, for reproduction. They have this, they go in heat, they have this urge and they have to fill it and then they do it. And then they go on with their, with their lives. They rarely stay together unless they're like birds. You know what I mean? Like, like turtle doves or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and man though, man isn't a beast, man was made to control his desire so that at any at any time that it was appropriate 
uh, the the man the man and the woman could come together and and love each other, enjoy each other uh, with 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 also their minds. And from that would come a child. And so that the reason did not depart like as if they were beasts while mm -hmm. they were together. That's why that's why that's why we, that's how we were created. We were not created to just simply do whatever we want. And now after the fall, we we don't have the control of these things that we used to. And as as our confessions say on the mayor and in and the apology says in on the marriage uh, of priests or concerning the marriage of priests, if marriage was necessary before the fall, that is, it was not good that man should be alone. How much more necessary is it now? Is it now? Yeah. You know, because of fornication, let every man have his own wife. And that's where um, the, the temptation to, I just saw a clip from the show friends the other week. And I just like, I used to watch that occasionally as a kid, as a teenager. And it was amazing to me how they treated they just everybody's just fornicating with everybody, right? Mm -hmm. And they act as if this doesn't actually change them or affect them or do anything harmful to them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so this is this is the this was the same thing in, in the Greco Roman world. It's just it's going to happen, you know? And it was almost comical. And that's what you have today. You know, I never watched the show Sex in the City, but from what I've read and people have told me it's that same basic thing. It's, it's, they make, they make it a comedy. They make it funny, just like the Greeks did, just like the Romans did. And so they mock, there's this trivialization of something that is extremely serious. That is, that is, you know, it's like people saying it's just sex. Oh yeah. yeah. Just the means by which God cr creates human beings, you know, just, just the means by which you came into being just that, you know what I mean? Just, just something really, really important, you know, just that that's all we're yeah. doing because they've separated the purpose of it. They've separated the purpose of it. And I don't know, I'm still mad that you guys didn't print my article. I don't know who is on this Godstein's board that wouldn't want to print that. And I think it's because I allude to this, right? Yeah. We need to come together on contraception. We need to come together on the purpose of marriage and on the sexes, we need to come together on this. If we don't, mm -hmm. then we're going to, you know, to, united we stand, divided we fall. I'm not going to, I, I, you know, we all fight against sin in our lives and in the world. And I'm not going to follow the way that the Missouri Synod has gone in just treating children and the purpose of sex as if it's like, yeah, as long as you're married, you can do whatever you want. That's basically what a lot of these antinomians have been taught in the Missouri Synod. Yeah. And people say, oh, well, we're, they're not convinced yet. And so we got to work. At, how are they going to get, get convinced, Jason, if we don't just simply say it and argue it? This Correct. is like, this is like the argument that people say, people, people say this all the time, you know, like, don't tell them, uh, there's this guy who is ministering to my dad met him at uh, St. Paul. And he ended up, he ministered to the homosexuals in the city. Right. And, uh, and Concordia St. Paul. This is back mm -hmm. in the 70s. And so my dad asks him, he's given this presentation on how he ministers to them. He says, do you ever tell them that, that what they're doing is sin? And he said, no. Well, then, then I couldn't minister to them. And it's like, well, then you're not ministering to them. <laughs> do, do, do you see what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, I understand. You don't just, you know, we don't have to be like that. What's that Baptist church in Topeka? Westboro Baptist, where the God hates fag sign you know right. they actually have they sell t-shirts that says that, that say that they even protested st john's in topeka when i was there they had like disgusting signs out there that's not what i'm saying mm -hmm. i'm just saying that when we're dealing with these issues we really have to speak clearly people don't know they just assume that it's just totally appropriate to wait until they're ready to have kids to wait until they have this or that and they don't realize that they're they're acting like pagans they're acting right. like, the same, you know, and this is where we're all being tempted to do this. We're all being tempted. Everything is over sexualized. You can't have something just you can't have something that's just chaste and, 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 and fun. You know, everything has to be has to be alluded to. There has to be some sort of incense pinched out for Aphrodite. You know what I mean? Yeah, there was a show, 
uh, I really liked the show King of the Hill. I didn't watch it much, but I, I watched several episodes back in the day. And um, there was one episode where there was this guy at work who made everything, turned everything into sexual innuendo and everybody laughed and everything. Well, Hank, who was the father, was talking to one of the women like, why do you, you know, why do you hang out with this guy? And why do you laugh? And she says, I just laugh because I don't know what to do, but I prefer that it not happen, you know? And so Hank mm -hmm. takes care of it. And that's what's happening to everything. But that's recognized by a guy. I don't know if the guy, I don't think the guy who wrote King of the Hill is a Christian. Maybe he is. He, they do have that one episode. I'm sure you've seen that, that scene where his son gets uh, taken by a, uh, he gets uh, influenced by this Christian rocker and he starts playing <laughs> the music and he goes, you're not making Christianity any better and you're making rock and roll worse. Yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's kind of a cool show. So you have these moral things, but people recognize this, you know, everything. And then you see, you know, we have laws against sexual harassment in the workplace because they put women together to work with each other. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you, you can't talk about it there, but guess where you can talk about it in the schools. They're going to teach your children to worship Aphrodite. They're going to tell them that, hey, you can be this and you can be that. And and this is what they taught me at the public school. You know, mm -hmm. this is that this is a dogma. You can't. One time I was talking with a young woman. Uh, she wasn't a Christian and she she was here and she was talking about her, uh, you know, past boyfriends or whatever. And uh, and I just said, yeah, man, that's really sad. You know, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm glad you found someone you know to love. And she said, hey, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not apologizing. I'm not saying that what I did was wrong. You know, mm -hmm. that was my decision. I, I have the right to do that. And I was just like, wow, you know, it's this no, you know, no, no consequence. There's no consequence. And in fact, it was good for me. She said it was good for me because I learned and that's the worship of Aphrodite. You know, I needed that. Mm -hmm. I needed that. It's not, maybe it's not my favorite thing, but you can't, you can't stop it. It's going to be there. And, and that attitude, if when we have it in our lives, you know, that attitude that we have in our lives, if we keep it there, then we also ignore what's happening. So we see this with, with the, with the, the trans, the trans people, right? We see this with sex slavery, you know, I mean, this is what was happening in Greco-Roman times. You'd walk by a building on your way to work where children were being raped. That's where you, that's what you would you know, and it's not that like it's done in secret here still because we still have that vestige, you know, and there was a guy I just heard about him. He killed like 30 pedophiles or something like that. 20 some pedophiles. Huh. Like he just like, yeah, he, 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 he got, he's going to prison, I guess. But he basically just he find he found out there's somebody close to him who got, you know, hurt by his pedophile. And he's like, all right, I'm taking him out, you know. So he goes and he kills him. Then he's like, then I saw that I was pretty good at it. And so he just kept doing it. Then there's this, so this t-shirt advertised online and it said, support your local pedo killer. And I was just like, well, I'm glad that, you know, that in America, even with their tolerance of all these other uh, perversions, they're actually standing, you know, they, they, they are disgusted by that. Because this is the thing, Jason, the only, only religion ever to stop child sex slavery and the use of children in, in sex is the Christian religion. It's mm -hmm. the only religion. And by that, I mean, from the time of, of, of the garden of Eden from Genesis three on, yeah. you know, that's, that's the only religion in the world that truly protects them mm -hmm. and every other religion, you know, and that's also a mark of like, obviously this stuff happens to lots of people, you know, but this was a vestige of monasticism where uh, right away, you know, this is this is uh, Athanasius. This is my only beef with him. It shows that they were sinners, just like, you know, uh, uh, Am Augustine had his his irresistible grace thing. You know, mm -hmm. he loved Saint Anthony, and Saint Anthony went out into the desert because of all the corruption and worldliness. And Saint Anthony was a good man, uh, and and he was Orthodox. The monks were Orthodox, but they left. They started leaving their families. They left mm -hmm. their families. And then there, I, I read this book on the sayings of the Desert Fathers in college. And there are two instances of, of, that I, I remember from reading this book. One is uh, a saying by Abba Isaac or something like that. that said, do not bring young boys into the desert for nothing but evil comes from this. 
And the other is that the two monks were walking and they passed by a guy who was molesting a boy. And the guy says to him, one monk says to the other, aren't you going to, Abba, aren't you going to stop him? And he said, well, I have, I have my sins as well. Who am I to judge? And so that was like, that was like part of, that was latent in monasticism. I'm not saying that that happened all over the place and everywhere right away in monasticism. I don't, I don't think it did, but that is the pagan vestige. You know, this is where the Christian world, Christianity was legal, but these things were still happening. And Christianity, hundreds of years for Christianity to really blot this out and stop it. And that's why the Christians have been so, uh, have persecuted the, the, the sexually immoral. The Christians have done it, and that's why they're coming back so hard. They hate those who won't let them worship Venus. They just can't stand. They, they say, we're doing something holy. And and really, there's no place for a Christian to say, hey, just let them do what they want. It's okay. It's fine. Like Margaret Thatcher said, as long as they don't do it in the streets. And everybody laughed and said, oh, aren't we tolerant? And we're maintaining freedom and all this other stuff. And you look at, there is this, uh, there is this joke I, who said this? I forgot where I read, though I saw a video of it. Somebody posted it. I think it was Larry Bean, actually. Um, but it was this guy who uh, he he saw that he was moving. Uh, his friend saw that he was moving out of England. He said, why are you moving out of England? And he said, well, uh, uh, 500 years ago, uh, the Sodomites were drawn and quartered and burned to death. Mm-hmm. And, and 100 years ago, they were they were hanged, you know, or 200 years ago, they were hanged and a hundred years ago, they were imprisoned. And, 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 and now, or 50 years ago, and this was back in the seventies, I think. And, and, and now they just get a little fine. And so, uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm leaving before they get me, you know, I'm leaving before, you know, there's no punishment for it at all. Mm -hmm. Right. And now it's celebrated. If you don't celebrate it, if you don't celebrate it, they'll they'll persecute you. You must worship Venus. It's, it's a power that's greater than you. It's mm-hmm. a power that is for us. It's above the gods. It's above any god that you're worshiping. Don't you tell me about Jupiter or Jesus, right? Venus, Eros was above them, and Venus can do whatever she wants. Do you see what I mean? Like it's yeah. the same. It's the same attitude because we are in paganism. We are in neo-paganism and all we have are vestiges of Christianity. Uh, like we can hold on. I'm grateful that people, they, they have been given uh, a culture that hates pedophilia. That's what we have here. Even the non-Christians think that pedophiles should be put to death, you know, mm-hmm. a lot for now. And, and, yeah, for now. <laughs> but that, that's the thing. But they're parasites on Christian virtue, you know. They're parasites on Christian virtue. They just, they use this good that we have and they use it for evil. You know, it's like mm-hmm. the, um, the, uh, my high school teacher warned, uh, my high school biology teacher warned, uh, us in class not to go to the, uh, the clubs, uh, the gay clubs in Fargo. He said, if any of you guys are gay, don't go to those clubs in Fargo because men from San Francisco fly there to get clean boys. In, 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 in the Northwest, you know, they go and they pray upon the innocent. They go and they pray upon them. And, and that's, that's where the more that is tolerated and calling, this is why I'm, I'm grateful for this term groomer that has come out and that mm-hmm. people are, are vociferously using that term groomer and they, which, which they they try to call hate speech, but people aren't buying it. You know, they continue mm-hmm. to do this. They're grooming people for the worship of Aphrodite. And, and, uh, and that's a good uh, it's good to to actually identify what they're actually doing. Um, so that's you know as, as far as as far as Aphrodite goes, she uh, she was considered the most beautiful. Of course, the judgment of Paris or Alexander came when you know he had to choose who to give a golden apple to, mm-hmm. and it was Min- Minerva or uh, or Athena, yes. and uh, and then Aphrodite or Venus. And Juno or Hera, and so they each promise him different things. And uh, the Athena pra- promises him wisdom, and Hera promises him I don't know a kingdom or something. I think, mm-hmm. and then Venus promises him the most beautiful woman in the world, and that's how the Trojan War got started. Right. Because 
and this is the the story. This is why why could Paris steal Helen? I people who think this is a myth, just a myth, I think are are naive. I think there was a man named Paris from Troy who stole a real woman named Helen, who was really a man named Menelaus's wife. I have no reason not to believe that. You see, there's too much evidence for it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, all the all of the trappings around it, of course. You know, we don't know. Um, uh, you have to. You just have to be discreet about it and, and and use some discernment. But the fact is, is that they made up a story because a man thought that he could have his neighbor's wife. He thought he deserved the most beautiful woman in the world. Now, what could possibly make you think that you deserve? The most beautiful woman in the world, even though she's another man's wife. And what, 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 what is it, Jason? What would make you think that you deserve? A demons. Yeah, a demon, a devil lying yeah. to you, lying to your flesh. So it's your pride, it's your sinful flesh. And when the world starts preaching that you deserve this, mm-hmm. that you can have this, they're preaching the same message that the devil preached to Paris. Mm-hmm. Do you see what I mean? Because yeah. behind Aphrodite is the doctrine, and behind the doctrine is a demon. Mm-hmm. And so we have demons out there, you know? So yeah. why we should watch, watch our behavior, watch our shows and what we watch and other things like that, because we're being taught false doctrine. You will not surely die. Did God really say, oh, but you're, but you know, you're having a hard time with your wife, or, or you're stressed out, and you need release, and all these other lies, you will not surely die. You know good and evil. You can figure this out. This is who you are. It's natural. This was all taught. This was all mm-hmm. taught in the Greco-Roman world. And, and it sounds reasonable. Do you see what I mean? So that's the, whereas the the the, uh, the Babylonians were much more just, they terrified you with the fear of it. Uh, uh, the, the, they had the same message that you can't resist it. You know what I mean? But but the Greeks were much more reasonable, reasonable about it and yeah. entertaining, and and they made it seem uh, civilized. You see, but it ultimately led to their ruin. You know. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah. So within the the Roman cultus around Venus, was it similar to what you see in the Greek cultus? Uh, and I mean, how did? like stoicism play in with all of that? Well, there's a famous saying, and it was by Cato the Elder. Now, Cato the Elder, I don't think was a stoic. He was, I think he was maybe, he was influenced by it. Um, But stoicism hadn't grown as much. Cato the Younger certainly was. But one time, uh, Cato the Elder saw a young man come out of a brothel. And they just had brothels. You know, I, mm-hmm. I don't think the Romans had, uh, they had temple prostitutes. They definitely had that, but they also just had brothels, right? And they had to wear, prostitutes had to wear a red toga, which is, shows that they're kind of being like men because women didn't wear togas, but it was red, you know, uh-huh. to, mark the, the, to mark the problem um, because they knew it was kind of shameful. Like, you know, hey, there's a whore. Okay. All right. Uh, so Cato, Cato saw this young man coming out of the brothel and he said, I commend you, young man. And the young man's like, oh, well, thanks. Great. You know, and then the next day he sees the same man coming out of the same brothel about the same time. And he says, I condemn you, young man. And the guy's like, what the heck, you know, and, and his, he said, why did you commend me yesterday and condemn me today? And he said, I commend you because you must have moderation. It's good to get your desire out. But I condemn you for not moderating your behavior and mm-hmm. and, and and being able to control yourself. You so see, it was still permitted. Oh yeah, yeah. Even I mean, the food. Romans, the Romans didn't. They what they did with their slaves was just disgusting. I mean, there's no nothing was forbidden to them. And the Roman woman, a, a Roman matron or wife, was was uh, you know, eventually they just started committing adultery with everybody too. I mean, it was just the, the, the upper echelons of Roman society, uh, of the, the, the patrician class, was absolutely disgusting by the time of Caesar Augustus. Mm-hmm. And he even had to exile his own daughter for being, a, for being uh, an adulteress, mm-hmm. you know. But, but it, was, it, was, uh, it was tolerated, but they always knew that it was, they always knew that it was bad. 
but mm-hmm. the man could do whatever he wanted. A man, a man, you know, having dalliances uh, with his, his slaves, it was, it was halfway expected. And it was considered strange when, um, like, I think it's the Emperor Claudius, if I'm remembering right. Claudius was married. No, was it was Claudius or which one was it? Not Claudius. Tiberius? I'm forgetting. It was a Roman emperor within the first, like, 60 years or something. Mm-hmm. He never cheated on his wives, but they cheated on him. And it was considered strange that he didn't cheat on his wife, but actually, you know, adored them. And our, you know, you see this happen occasionally where like the the courts of the the kings of europe were known for their mistresses and all this horrible stuff until you get like george the third of 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 american fame you know what i mean who Mm -hmm. had 10 children or something with his wife and never once stepped out on her you know uh so occasionally you get these you get actual you'll, you'll get people who know how to control themselves but the uh the uh dictator sulla who won the civil war uh, in in the first century BC, he, and 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 reconstituted the the uh, the Roman Republic more towards a conservative route. Mm-hmm. He was a conservative who was known for uh, not just uh, his his dalliances with women, but with with boys. Mm-hmm. And um, he he was going to die, and he like spent the last part of his days basically just you know doing whatever he wanted. Yeah. And it was so it's, it's strange that they could, you know, they knew that this was that this was bad, but they but they uh, they knew it was bad and to some extent, um, but they thought it was a proper way of moderating your your desire so that you can focus on other things that are more uh, that are more uh, manly, like building something or fighting a war mm-hmm. or something like that, you know. So so while the Greco-Roman cultists around Aphrodite and Venus said to indulge those passions. Uh, where, where, where does God, the true God direct us? Um, you know, so Satan lies and says, indulge these things and it will be, um, a, and you'll be what better than before, or you will yeah. have clarity of mind or you'll be, um, uh, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever good is held out what is um what is the the true god's vision and what is the goodness that's held out or given well yeah the goodness is in creation we it's do, do i believe that god made me to love my neighbor as myself do i believe that god created me to have have a wife and to raise children and mm-hmm. to honor her body to honor her body and to recognize and to honor God in her body by, with the proper use. St. Paul says, abandoning the natural use of the right, abandoning, abandoning that. Um, it, that's what the, that's what they did. Um, and so he gave them over. And so they, they, that's why they invent these, these false gods is because God has given them over their desires. And, and so they do shameful things like the punishment mm. of sodomy, for example, is sodomy itself. Mm. It's, it's because they're not acknowledging God. And so, you know, for us Christians, we, the first we examine our lives according to the Ten Commandments and God threatens to punish all who break these commandments. Therefore, we should fear his wrath. He is a jealous God and adultery and fornication is, uh, is, 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 often, is often compared to and associated with idolatry because you're giving your affection, you're giving your desire, which should be for God to a false God. And so also when these desires come, we need to see we need to confess to ourselves we need to say this to ourselves and we need to go to the scriptures and read these passages which say that no fornicator or unclean person has any inheritance in the kingdom of god we need to recognize that god's law is true and we need to if no matter how many how many times and how how often this this has taken over a christian's life he can't say well you know god understands God, God condemns this. He condemns it. And so we repent. We turn away from the sin and we turn to the true God. And it's in, in who, who, this is no joke to him. It is no joke that we are, fe- we are not, we are not uh, humorously and wondrously made. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And we turn to the true God and we say, as, as David did in Psalm 51, he said, uh, he said, 
against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, that you may be justified in your words and clear in your judgment. So we say that God is right to condemn us hmm. for our for our lust, for, for any unclean act that we have committed. We, are, we say he is right to condemn the world. He's right to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He's right to send the Romans to destroy Carthage. He is right to do that. He is just to punish sin. He is, he, he is, he is, uh, uh, he is not wrong. He did not give these sinful desires. He gave them over to them. He let them do them because they didn't acknowledge him. And so when we are overtaken by these desires, it's because we are not acknowledging the true God. We're not seeing that he is God. And if we are Christians, then we are saying we are, we, we, we are ignoring the power of Christ's forgiveness. We're ignoring the fact that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's specifically what Paul is talking about when he says your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He says you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. And so when you haven't done that, the only power and the only strength comes from actually turning away from the sin to see Christ bearing that sin away because you were bought. And his, you, you, and he says, such were some of you. And you say, oh, this is who I am. This is who I am. No, turn away. Who cares what your flesh says? Who cares what the desires say? You turn to Christ and your baptism. And that baptism says, such were some of you, but you were washed. You were justified. You were sanctified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of your, of our God. So you go back to that baptism, which also now saves you, not by the removal of filth from the flesh, but by, by, by an appeal to God for a good conscience, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you were buried with him. These desires, these desires that you have, you crucify them. You have crucified them. You crucify them again. And you give the sin to Jesus to wash away and you rejoice in his forgiveness and you believe it and you thank him. And if there's any psalm that I, I would recommend, it would be Psalm 50, uh, not Psalm 51. That's good for repentance, but Psalm 50, because Psalm 50 says a few things. It says, first, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will glorify me. And so you call upon him. You don't say, oh, I'll repent later. No, you call upon him. And is, 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 have you been caught in sin? This is the day of trouble. Call upon him and he will answer you he will deliver you because it is also the day of grace and you will glorify him that is you will live a life of contrition and repentance putting to death the old man and all of his sins and his evil works mm -hmm. and and then also in psalm 50 is 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 um no he says uh you 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 uh kept company with adulterers you keep company with adulterers and 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 slander your own mother's sons and you thought that I was such a one altogether like you, but now I will. Uh, but now I will set it in order before your eyes. Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you to pieces, and there be none to deliver. Whoever offers sacrifice glorifies me, and to him who orders his conduct aright will I show the salvation of our God. And these words are precious to the Christian who believes that his sins are forgiven. Who, who believes it and is struggling to because the sin seems to be more powerful. And that's always what the devil says. The sin's more powerful than Jesus. No, it is not. It is not. He says, he says, whoever offers sacrifice glorifies me. Oh, so we're saved by our sacrifice. No, 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 no. The sacrifice is whoever would come after me must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels will find it. And so you give up that life for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the truth that your sins are forgiven, for the sake of the truth that Christ bore those sins and has destroyed the devil. And so Aphrodite and Astarte and, and Ishtar and Anana are crushed beneath his feet as with the devil who is their father. And all of these sins and all of their power were born in Christ's body and overcome and crushed and Christ was risen, and you are joined to him in baptism, so that you, just as he was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so also we might walk in newness of life. And the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead will also bring life to your mortal bodies. And that's not just talking about the resurrection. That's talking about right now in this body subject to sin and death. The Holy Spirit gives life. And that means you deny yourself. You lose your life that you may gain it. You, you give it up. You, you cut off your hand you, you, and throw it away. Pluck mm -hmm. out your eye and throw it away. 
And 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 that's 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 what that's not to that's not what saves you. It's not what saves you. It's what it it, it, it is it is it is the fruits of faith. What what saves you is the word of God, is the law condemning you and 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 the gospel forgiving you and the Holy Spirit giving you new life and renewing you. That's what saves you. Now you won't want to fall back into this worldly into this worldly way. You don't want to fall back in the demon's possession. You don't want to be hurt by this because you want to follow Jesus. Well, where's where does his way go, Jason? Where does the way that Jesus taught us go? It goes to the cross. To the cross. It goes to self denial. You know, and that's where mm-hmm. like you know, watch your alcohol intake. Uh, the <clears throat> the worship of Venus is often associated with alcohol because you lose your inhibitions and you uh, you uh, you lose your self control, right? Mm-hmm. So Chemnitz puts adultery un, un, under the sixth command, uh, uh, gluttony and and drunkenness under the sixth commandment of Thou shalt yeah. not commit adultery. So so that's these are just things that you know as when we when you go you know go to your pastor confess your sin t- or talk to a brother you know um, you don't need to go to private confession contrary to what Peterson says private confession isn't a sacrament. The absolution is a sacrament, if it's going to be a sacrament. Um, I think it's valuable. We, we maintain private confession for the sake of the absolution, but Jesus didn't institute a private thing. Nevertheless, I think that it, it that you're wise to go to a brother, especially a pastor, mm-hmm. and, and confess this so that your sin is forgiven, so that you can say against the devil, uh, yeah, I remember when I did that. You remember when God forgave me through his called minister? You remember that? Uh, yeah. So that sin doesn't own me. You don't own me. Mm-hmm. Get the heck away. You know, yeah. I think you can say, get the hell away to the devil. I think you can do that because that's yeah. what he's bringing, you know? So, but confess your sins, have someone to talk to, you know? And, and this is where I say those people who aren't, um, you know, who aren't married and desperately want to, it's just getting so bad, Jason. It's so bad. You know, the, how many, we're just scattered everywhere. We just had a young, young adult retreat here. And it was wonderful to see these pious Christians becoming friends and, and, and learning, you know, and, and worshiping and singing together. But I, I just, I see the pain in these young, you know, young women in their twenties and thirties don't have a husband and these men in their twenties and thirties, late twenties and thirties, they don't have a, they don't have a wife. I see the pain in their eyes and I've talked to them, you know, and it's so painful, not just because of the, the loneliness, but because of the, um, because of the sin because they see it inside of themselves. They don't mm-hmm. have that, that, that help that, that, that marriage gives, you know? Yeah. And I, this is where there is lots of things to do. Lots of things to do is that you stay busy. Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire and he rages against all sound judgment. Go be with people. Well, there's nobody my age. Then go hang out with the old people. Go mm-hmm. offer to help them. Go on walks with them. Offer to babysit children. You know, or get go be with Christians. Go be with good Christians. Don't don't get drunk. Don't get high. Don't watch shows that mock that mock marriage. That worship Aphrodite. Just just get you know be. These are good things to do. Hang around Christians. If it's boring to you, it's because there's something wrong with you, and you yeah. should confess it. You know. Mm-hmm. We, it's, we should confess it. Like you say, oh, I don't like the people at the church. So then you don't like the Holy Christian church. You don't like it. You don't like the communion of saints. You know, mm-hmm. it, that's, it, that's what you're saying. And it's, 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 it's like not many wise according to the flesh are called. You know, God has chosen the, the foolish things of this world, the things that, that the world just walks on by. Yeah. To shame these things. And to, why, why? To shame them. To shame them. So don't be caught in that shame of the world. I think it's the same that, that, that attitude is the same attitude that is shameless with regard to sexual activity. Is yeah. to, to, to is to just say, well, I don't want that. I don't want that. That's exactly what it is. Well, you can just take it. You can just take it. Like 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 uh, um, Jefe said to El Guapo and the Three Amigos, "If you want a woman, you just take the woman." You know, that's the that's the that's what Aphrodite says. You know, yeah. you just take it. And and if you won't, if you don't want a real one, then we got all sorts of things for you to do. It's just all, and so we have to, you know, and this is the thing is that you never, ever, ever give up. You know, this happens to a lot of people. I I met, I met a young woman one time. She finally, she said, 
you know, I went through high school, I went through college, and I waited for God to give me a husband. He didn't. So I just went and did what I wanted to do, and I'm going to do it again. You know, because so basically, because she 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 fell, and then she said, "It's too powerful. I can't not do this. I have to do this." And that's the devil's lie. No, Christ. I don't care how many times you have fallen. You look at people who are who are beset with homosexual desires. Can you imagine how hard that is for them? How hard it is to, to have these desires that they know are shameful and they fight against it. They fight against it. And Christ is stronger than that sin. Jesus' blood cleanses us from all sin. Right. But don't go walk in darkness. Come back into the light. Get up. Get up. Don't give up. Get up. Give up and go to the Savior of sinners who promises not just to not just to forgive you, but to follow you with goodness and mercy all the days of your life. And that's that's what's so beautiful about the gospel, Jason. It's like yeah. you see this, this is what you know, sins loom in your conscience and sins loom in, right in front of us, and the world says, Look how strong I am. You must obey. There's no one stronger than this. Look, we're taking your children away from you. We have we have the media, we have Hollywood, we have all of these people worshiping us. All of us, and who are you, you little Christian? I well, I'll tell you what my name is. My name is David, and I have five stones. And I have the name of the Lord, my God, because I'm a Christian. I'm clothed with him and he's fighting for me. You dare to mock the armies of the living God. It's because you're blind and you don't see the angels that I see. Yeah. You know, it's like Elisha saying, open his eyes that he may see. Mm. So that's what you need to do. You need to open the eyes of your heart. And the only thing that's going to do that is the word of God. You stop going to church. I've seen this happen to people stop going to church and then boom, you know, you stop reading your Bible. You stop praying it's it's you're, you don't have the light you don't have the strength by our natural power we cannot subdue the flesh the the fleshly mind the carnal mind is enmity with god and is 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 and does not submit to the law of god nor indeed can it so remember what the lutherans taught you because they taught it from the scriptures you do not have the power to to overcome sin on your own only god does yeah and god well, I mean, this the power is this is james sin. point isn't it Right, resist yeah, the devil, yeah. and he will flee, he will from, flee you. from you. And he just before that he says, "Submit yourselves therefore to God." So yeah. the point is that you don't you don't resist the devil by your own strength and might, but rather by submitting yourselves to God, and he fights on your behalf. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's he fights on your behalf. It's like that one was it Jehosh, Jehoshaphat or Jehoshaphat? He goes down and. He goes down to fight, and all they do is just sing, I think is the story. And then the armies that came out to fight against him just kill each other, and they don't even lift their sword. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Even, this is because, because the only active, the only, you have the shield of faith, and you have the breastplate of righteousness, and you have the helmet of salvation, and, and, the, and, the, and the, the, the belt of truth, and the, the, the shoes or the sandals of the readiness of the gospel of peace. Those are all... All that's all armor. It's kind of passive. It helps you move. It keeps you going, you know. But but the only active weapon that you have is the word of God. All they did was just speak the word of God, and then they won. Mm -hmm. They didn't do anything because all of your strength and all of your power is is from the Holy Spirit, and you find Him in the Word of God. So blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, which never faileth to bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And that's that river, that law of God, that, that means the Bible there, the Torah. Yeah. It will, it, will, it will rebuke you. Yeah, it'll be hard. Jesus didn't promise you a bed of roses. He promised you a cross, but he promised you salvation. And, and before the cross is the sweet comfort of the gospel, and underneath the cross of that sacrifice and losing yourself is life eternal. Yeah. It's hope that this world does not have in worshiping Venus. Well, thank you for your time, Mark. I appreciate it. Uh, do you have, do you have anything coming up next for us on the gods of our age or does this wrap up? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I've, I don't think I've done, have I done Zeus? Was that the first one? Was it we Zeus? Had, I don't think we did Zeus. Okay. Yeah. I think I might, I might, I might do Zeus. I, I think we did. That was the first one because he's the weather god, and uh, I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I'll probably. I think I, I, I thought of one or two the other day, 
and now I can't bring them to mind because I'm only thinking about this. So yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, yeah. I'll look. I'll I'll keep on you. I'll keep pestering you, um, and uh, hopefully we'll have some more down the down the pike here. But thanks for your time. I appreciate it, and for all your insights. In the gods of our age are the same as the gods of past ages. So thank you very much. That's right. Thank you, Jason.